All right, here we go. So unit four of five, there's only one left. And this one is uh, kind of combining drum brakes and parking brakes. But as you'll see, the parking brake lends itself very well to the drum brake design. So, and there's not really a ton of um, drum brake to know. So it's a perfect spot for it. So if we jump right in, let's go. There's your drum brakes. And here we'll talk about some of the components. So here's your whole drum brake assembly, a lot more moving parts than disc. And if you look, note to the left is the front of the vehicle. So let's go part by part. Here's your wheel cylinder. You guys kind of maybe already know the wheel cylinder is the hydraulic part. It's basically the output piston of the hydraulic system. This is the adjuster, and this is very important. Uh, your brake shoes need to be in close proximity to the drum. If there's a big gap right there, that's when your pedal drops kind of low, and customers, cons they, they complain about that type of thing. So that's where we would do our adjustment. Additionally, you're going to see further into the lecture, the adjustment should occur as you drive the vehicle, whether you back up or sometimes when you apply the parking brake and release it, it's a self adjuster, but it doesn't always work real well. Okay. But it's there. And then as you can see the return spring, essentially the purpose of the return spring is to pull the, 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 the shoes in when, when you step on the pedal and it expands the shoes using the wheel cylinder and you release the pedal, the spring should should retract the springs should should retract the shoes away from the drum, um, and then as you can see the the shoes are held down by hold down springs. So those are very different springs. They really just hold the shoes to the backing plate, but kind of loosely so they can still move. And then the lining. Now I would say the lining and the brake shoe are are really the same part. So the brake shoe tends to more be like the metal support, let me say like the web of the shoe, and then the lining is bonded to the shoe. But for our purposes, when we say brake shoes, we're talking about linings. When you say linings, we're talking about brake shoes. We don't really separate the two because you really, we don't separate the two parts either. Like you don't replace just the lining material, you replace the shoe, see what I mean? Um, and then, as you can see, the anchor spring anchors the bottom together. And, and this is going to really vary based on what design it has. So take this loosely. Um, this is one design of many, but the components will typically be kind of the same names, at least. And then the whole entire assembly is basically affixed or mounted to the backing plate. So the, the backing plate is the, the metal part. So here's like another, another view of it kind of exploded. You see the backing plate here. That's essentially the, the, the mounting point. That's really what the backing plate does. And then you can see the wheel cylinders bolted up. The brake, the brake line or brake hose is coming into the wheel cylinder. We've got some hold down pins and those go through the shoes and through the spring into the hold down springs with the retainers. One little one little word of warning, if you go to inspect drums, they're kind of hard to see sometimes without taking apart. Sometimes you can't see them unless you pull the drum off. And other times you can maybe pop a little cover off the backing plate and look in there and you can see how thick the lining is. But in the case you have to actually pull the drum off, they really do tend to get a lip on the on the drum where it's like, inboard of the sh of the shoe when you go to pull it the drum gets stuck on the shoe you pull hard enough the only thing holding this shoe on is this little pin and this little retainer it's almost like a little cap if you pull hard enough you will rip the end off of that or you'll snap the pin and what was a brake inspection is now a minimum of needing an uh, 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 um, hardware kit and probably realistically, because there's a lip, the drums need to be resurfaced. And then probably it's pretty typical that your brake shoes are going to be worn. And, you know, it's not uncommon that the wheel cylinder is leaking. So if, if you go to pull drums off and they're stuck and you're not exactly sure how to deal with it, I would stop right there and I would go to some level of supervisor and say, hey, I know I'm supposed to pull the drums on this MPI, but they're stuck. And they're going to say, whoa, stop, stop, stop. Because... 
they know they don't want to have that job blow up on them where it was supposed to just be a an MPI. And now they're telling the customer, you need all these drum parts. And they're saying, I didn't, I don't want to do the work, but you can't put it back together. So the dealer may end up having to pay for that. That'd be like an internal fee. They'd have to basically eat the cost. All right. So if you go to pull them off and they're not coming off, you know, slow down. Now there's some workarounds and some tricks. And uh, I did try to show that on a video, but I definitely need to make, you know, this is going to be the theory of drum breaks. And then doing the drum break work is really a separate lesson. And so we're going to build out some videos to help you. For example, if you couldn't get the drum off and you knew it was because there's a lip, you can actually go through with a screwdriver and turn the adjuster wheel down. And when I say down, I don't mean necessarily in the downward direction. I'm sorry, but we call it down. Turn it down means like retract the, the shoes. And then all of a sudden, boom, the drum will pop off. Nice. But you got to be pretty coordinated to, to get in there. And, and it helps if you know what it looks like in there. And it's hard to know what it looks like when the drum is on. So it's a little tricky. Right. And then as you can see, um, the shoes are here. We've got various types of return springs, hold down springs, little small mechanisms that are going to work for self-adjusting the star wheel. So there's a lot of parts here, some of which would be replaced on a <clears throat> brake job and some of which we reuse. And you got to know which ones are which. So we will a little later. All right. There's a drum just to start. Here's a tip. The brake drum is balanced from the factory. Um, so if you ever see anything that looks like a little tab, that's kind of like tack welded on there. Don't mess that up because if you mess that up, now it's out of balance and we can't balance those. So don't do that. Right, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the, the drum. The drum is basically uh, the part that provides the rotating friction surface. And that's where the brake pad or the brake shoe lining is gonna contact. They're typically made from cast iron because cast iron is really good for high temperatures, can absorb a lot of heat and it maintains its shape. And you remember in the last one, the pros and cons, right? Drum brakes, we don't apply a whole lot of force to them because the drum can actually flex, you know, it would be um, essentially um, temporarily bending the drum, like they call it deflection. So we need the drum to be fairly strong. So use cast iron, cast iron's heavy though, that's the negative. And then additionally to en enhance the cooling, we may actually use uh, cooling fins. And in some rare cases, there are drums that are made of aluminum, not real common. So here's a typical drum. And this would be a drum with cooling fins. More than likely, this is going to be from something heavy duty. Um, back in the day, drums would be on the front. The front drums would most likely have cooling fins. But now the drums are never going to be on the front ever. But if it's a big, heavy truck, it could actually have cooling fins on the rear. It's not real common. Um, and then here's another couple types. So the one type of drum is what I would say the common one. It's hubless. This drum is sitting up against a hub. When you go to pull it off, you're just basically pulling it off the hub and the studs and everything stay. But there's another type that has a hub attached. And basically when you go to pull this type of drum off, you can see you're gonna take the lug nuts off, but this drum will not lift off the hub because it's an integral part, they're together. The drum and the hub are one. So to actually pull the drum off, you have to pull the hub off too. And there's a dust cap here. You pull that off and there's a lot of times a cotter pin and a nut and you'd have to loosen the nut. You pull the whole drum and the hub and also the wheel bearings are coming out with it. So there's a little bit of a technique on how to do these, but those are the two different types. Obviously the hub style drums would be quite a bit more money. Now, next component is the backing plate. So there you see a backing plate that's stripped. When you do the drum brake, uh, a good service, you're going to basically strip it down to the bare backing plate like that. Um, you'll notice this has um, the brake shoe pads. So th those are basically like raised parts of the stamped steel uh, backing plate. That's where the brake shoes sit. But you remember how our brake shoes move? It's interesting because if our brake shoes are sliding across that part of the backing plate, we should probably have a little bit of grease on there. So that's a point we're gonna, we're gonna uh, show a little bit later. That, that would be part of a good proper service. You'd put some grease on those points. It would be a specific type of grease. 
um, you, drum brakes tend to be a little more forgiving, like unlike disc brakes, but uh, typically, and, and that's mainly because drum brakes were, were not having a lot of rubber seals that were greasing up. Whereas like the pins, the guide pins and calipers, they have the rubber down in the bottom. We're worried about any petroleum because it's going to swell the rubber. Well, see, you could probably actually get away with like uh, a typical petroleum based grease here, but it would have to be high temperature. And so sometimes you'll see grease that says high temperature brake grease. And you're like, oh, it's perfect for, for brakes. Like, no, that doesn't mean it's good for disc brakes. They really more mean it's good for drum brakes because drum brakes are just metal to metal. If it's petroleum based, it's a no for your disc brake guide pins at least. So to simplify it, we're probably gonna use the typical disc brake caliper lube, like that purple ceramic stuff, or even, even my favorite would be the, the silicone paste. Um, and so Renee, the answer on anti-seize, anti-seize can't touch anything rubber. So disc brakes, guide pins, no. Drum brakes, maybe fine. It could be fine. So if you see somebody put anti-seize right here, that's legit. You just never want to put anti-seize and disc brake guide pins with rubber in them. No, no, no. Okay, and so then you'll notice there's some holes for the hold down uh, springs or the pins. There's a spot for the wheel cylinder. This one actually has an upper anchor. I could tell what type of drum, drum brake system this is because it has that upper central anchor right there. Additionally, if you look, this has knockouts. They're made of like metal, but they're just held on by a little tack weld. You can actually smack that with your chisel. You'd never use a flathead screwdriver and a hammer, would you? You can knock those out and then you can actually do your adjustment with the drum on. And that's the best way to fine tune an adjustment. But if you don't recognize it as a knockout, you'll say there's no hole that you can't adjust it like that until someone with more experience comes over and says, oh, that's a knockout. Put your screwdriver up there and smack it and chong, comes out. Of course, you kind of already have to have the drum off. Otherwise, that metal piece gets stuck and ruins the, the whole system. But once we knock those out, we're actually supposed to put a rubber plug back in there. And that way, we're keeping uh, moisture. And you know, if we go through a puddle, that's going to actually reduce the amount of dirt and junk that gets in there. But um, dr drums to the backing plate, it, there is no seal per se. But there is what we call a labyrinth seal so labyrinth basically means if water gets in the backing uh, gets inside of the drum in the backing plate water or air can actually come out but to come out it has to go like around this very tight passage and around and around and around so that's when that's what they mean by labyrinth seal it's not airtight it's not watertight it's just little junk can't get up in there you know, so the drum brakes are not exposed to uh, every little splash or, um, you know, let's say that you have a little bit of a, a differential leak. The oil really, an external differential leak should really not get up in there. Now, it's different if it's an axle seal, but we're talk, we'll talk about that later. So that's the labyrinth seal. Part of the reason I want to point this out, when we go to pull drums off, we don't want to be shoving a screwdriver back here and prying and bending because it's pretty tight. So if you bend one of them, now they're touching, you're gonna to get a noise and the car's gonna come back and it's gonna be kind of hard to fix the noise and you might have to actually pull the wheel and pull the drum back off and straighten the backing plate and hopefully not have to replace the backing plate because to replace a backing plate, remember that's what it looks like when it's stripped, but you gotta strip it all off first. So they can be a little bit of a job. Part of the backing plate, we have this anchor pin on the top or we could have an anchor pin on the bottom. Um, we most likely, won't have both, but we could have one or the other. Um, and then next part's the wheel cylinder. So the wheel cylinder is essentially like the caliper of drum brakes. Hydraulic fluid comes in from the master cylinder. Uh, it's going to fill this chamber, and this chamber is going to push both the left and the right uh, cup seals, which are attached, it's pistons basically, like kind of like a master cylinder. And those pistons are going to move. And basically, there's going to be some sort of a, a link or a pin right here. And that's literally what's going to push on the drum. So if you can visualize it, it expands like this. And it pushes the drums out into the, uh, it pushes the shoes out into the drum. Right. So that's, 
your basic of a wheel cylinder, they could look a little different. Here's what it looks like from the outside. So this is an anchor that's separate from the wheel cylinder. The wheel cylinder's down here. Wheel cylinder is typically held on by a couple bolts and just the line. It's not something that's real hard to do, um, but then you also have to bleed the brakes. Um, and so let's see. Um, like you can see, here's the here's the uh, passage, and this is called a double acting, which basically means it's got the two pistons. They don't all actually have that. Um, like it says, it's got a lip seal. So just how just how a caliper can leak, a wheel cylinder can leak too. So if we have one of these lip seals that are, um, let's say, old or you know torn or for whatever reason bad, that means we're going to leak brake fluid. The brake fluid is going to leak around the seal and it's going to leak out into here. But that may never hit the ground. Who can tell me why you wouldn't necessarily see that easily on a brake inspection? Who knows? Wouldn't the drum be covering it? So, yeah, yeah. That's so you're not going to really see it? Pretty much. I mean, the drum doesn't totally consume it, but a lot of times the brake fluid just kind of builds up in there and you may actually never see it physically leak out, at least until it becomes like really bad. If it's really bad, you you might see it, but yeah, that 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 brake fluid just splashes around in there and then the brake dust ends up getting stuck to the brake fluid and more brake dust and just ends up with like a big massive buildup in there. It may never actually work its way out the labyrinth seal. It's really nasty. So if you pop one out, if you pop a drum off and you see it all wet, you have to determine, is it leaking from the wheel cylinder? And it probably is, but it could also be the axle seal if it's a truck or a, an SUV with a solid rear axle. Um, and so, you know, keep that in mind. We could technically rebuild uh, a wheel cylinder if we, if we want. And so like jump to this one, as you can see, there's seals. We can get those seals and this is the dust boot and this is the cylinder itself. We could actually run a hone through there and recondition it. But uh, you can probably buy a wheel cylinder for about 20 bucks. And if you buy a wheel cylinder for $20 and it fails, that's kind of like, that would be covered by, let's say it was O'Reilly's. O'Reilly is going to give you a wheel cylinder because the first one's defective. And if it fails in a way that's unsafe, you know, that's kind of on O'Reilly's, assuming, assuming it wasn't something that you did on installation. But if the part fails, it's the part manufacturer's fault. If you rebuild a wheel cylinder and that one fails, ooh, that you're a little closer to being in trouble, you see? So, so with stuff like this, we don't, we don't really rebuild it because A, I said it was $20. It's cheap. It's actually more expensive to have you rebuild it than it is to buy new. But also, we don't want to do a lot of stuff like this because unless there's a good amount of money in it where it's worth us potentially ending up on the hook on rare occasions for something that goes wrong, we're, we're just... If I'm going to take a risk, there needs to be a pretty big reward I'm going to be willing to take the risk for. See what I'm saying? So I try to, I try to put my mind, you know, try to put my imagination in the perspective of the business owner. It's not enough money, 20 bucks, get a new wheel cylinder. So we probably won't fix those. Um, the pistons are typically used, made out of uh, anodized aluminum. But like I said, the, the wheel cylinder itself, it's going to be smooth and clean. But if your brake fluid has been in the system for a long time and it hasn't been, you know, properly, uh, replaced or flushed, you may end up with moisture. And then if you see moisture in the system, that's going to start to corrode the iron on that wheel cylinder. Next thing you, know, you got pitting and see, that's a problem. If it's pitted, there's no way for that seal to seal against a surface that's rough. You know, pitting is like, it's like craters. It's like, look at the the face of the moon and you see all those craters, you can't have a gasket seal all those craters. So if it's pitted, that cylinder shot, you're probably not even gonna be able to hone it, you know, so that's some things. And then here's, here's a little bit about, you know, when we go to bleed it, the bleeders right there. Um, and this is actually the better view of what a bleeder does anyway. So, you know, we bleed it just like a caliper, step on the brakes, and then you're actually going to loosen the bleeder after you pull that rubber cap. By the way, that rubber cap is not to help it seal. That rubber cap is to keep the dirt and debris out. And the reason we do that is 
when you unthread it just a little bit and in a, a Tony, Tony step on the brakes, you know what I'm saying? Tony, how you doing? Tony stepping on the brakes, the brake fluid should come up. When we loosen it, this seat unseats from the bore and then fluid will come around, but it has to go in this little hole. It's like a banjo. And then it goes up and out. But the thing is, if this gets packed with rust and debris because we didn't put the cap back on, well, then you'll go to loosen it and nothing will come out and you'll be confused and you'll actually have to unthread the whole bleeder to bleed it. And, and then you'll thread it back down and say, pump it. And then you'll say, hold it. And then you'll literally unthread, 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 take the whole thing out. Yes. Or you can just replace the bleeder. So it's just better to put the cap back on that hopefully is a visual on how the bleeder works. This is also when we tighten the bleeder down, that's why it's pretty critical we follow that torque spec. There's no gasket, it's just a tapered seat where the bleeder face seat meets the bore face seat. And they're, they're just like a one, somewhere between one and three degrees difference. So they should make a solid metal to metal seal, kind of like a flare from brake lines. And then here's a different type of wheel cylinder. This is a single acting. So this this one doesn't have two pistons. It's only got one piston. It's actually only going to push one side. And there's an adjuster on this style. And this is the double acting. This is more normal, like what we covered before. Now, brake shoes. So here's your brake shoe. Um, this one, for example, is a primary and secondary set. So one brake shoe is different than the other brake shoe. Some brake shoes are the same front to rear, you know, primary to secondary, and some are different. Um, this one, and and sometimes they're different in an apparent way, and sometimes they're different in a not apparent way, and we'll cover that in a little bit. But but in the parts, this is the lining table, which mostly we call the shoe. And technically this part that's in here, it looks kind of like a web, is called the web, both parts of the shoe. And then the lining's actually, uh, attached to the shoe itself. We'll talk about how we attach it in a second, but this is the primary and this is the secondary and primary and secondary. It's not to say that primary does more and secondary does less. It's not true at all. It's just, if you were standing there and the car drove past you, the primary would pass you first. So essentially the primary is towards the front of the car. The secondary is towards the rear of the car. That's the only difference, primary, secondary, cool. So, and uh, you'll notice service tip, they may be similar in shape, but they're not interchangeable. You have to make sure in the right spot. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, and so the metal brake shoes that have whole slots and tabs, so that each one of those parts on the shoe, you know, there's got, there's gonna be a hole or a slot or a tab or something. They all need to be there and they all need to be in the right spot or you won't be able to, let's say, hook up the return spring properly. So be, be very careful when you're working on these. And the golden rule, as I've explained already, the golden rule of drum brakes is you work on one side at a time so that way you can walk over the other side and look. And pictures are good. By all means, take pictures. But in the case your picture doesn't get one detail in you know view, you still want to keep one side apart. You don't rip both sides apart and then try to assemble both sides. You will probably have to reference that. I would even reference it, and I've done a lot of brake work. Okay, and then also we talk about the friction material. The composition of the lining material affects the brake operation. So we can get into all the details, and that's not really my strong point, but... Um, if we have a high coefficient of friction material, that's going to have, uh, you know, more bite, you could say. You're going to go to stop and it's going to stop faster. But if we have a low coefficient of friction material, that's going to not have as much bite. That's not going to stop as quick. However, that changes with temperature. So if you had that, that very, gra the very strong grabby breaks, by the time they get hot, they will actually become glazed and they won't stop very well at all. So, you know, they the manufacturer figures out exactly what to do with that lining, and then that's the lining type that they use. So when it's OEM, it's gonna stop like OEM. If it's a Corolla, it's gonna stop like a Corolla, and another Corolla, and another Corolla, and another Corolla. If the customer decides to go non-OEM on their brake shoes, or really any part, 
I'm not so sure if the aftermarket shoes are going to have the same coefficient of friction. They may have a little bit higher. They may have a little bit lower. They may have ceramic. They may have semi-metallic, right? So these are some of the things we talk about with disc brakes. It's the same with drums. Some might tend to be more noisy or less noisy. So, so one of the things I want to make sure you guys understand, um, it's not that I don't know both sides of the argument, but I'm trying to show you guys through my perspective, which is dealership, which is why I think I'm a pretty good fit for this particular job. I was a dealership guy more than anything else. And when, when somebody brings their car to the dealership, it's not because they want the cheapest price. It's not because they want the best deal. And despite what sometimes the dealer thinks, it's not because they have the best little cookies in the waiting room or because they have the nicer shuttle. It's probably because they care about the car, they want it fixed right, and they want it to be like new. So I really like that, you know, for us, this is T10, you guys are learning, you know, the, the Toyota dealership way. The car should come in stopping the same as our, all Corollas and it should leave stopping the same as all Corollas. So some of this will be a little over your head, but it's still important to know. And that way, you know, if a customer comes in and they say, oh yeah, I want to, I, can you actually get cheaper brake pads? Then it's going to, it's kind of like, you don't roll up to in and out and be like, oh, I don't want to pay $7 for a double, double. Can I bring, you know, the, like the Costco patty? Well, this is what we do. The name on the building is Toyota. If you don't want Toyota parts, don't come to the Toyota dealership, right? It's hard to argue with that logic. So we'll continue. Very good. The primary and the secondary shoe. Interesting. Remember, the primary is the first one. And the secondary is the second one if it drives by. But if you notice, I want to point something out. The primary and the secondary shoe look the same, like they have the same holes. Can anyone see a difference between the primary and the secondary? Sizing of the shoe, the secondary looks bigger than the primary. Exactly right. So if you look, this primary, the metal is the same, but the lining is, you see a big gap right here? This part of the shoe doesn't have as much lining. The lining starts up higher and it ends a little bit lower. So there's, let's say there's only six inches of lining here and over here there's seven inches of lining. The, the, here's the saying, okay? This is the saying as it was taught to me and it, it stuck with me all these years. Um, break shoes are like a family portrait. If you're gonna have somebody take a picture of your family, who's standing in the back? Abdul probably. Tall, tall people in the back, right? Tall shoe in the back. The taller shoe goes in the, goes in the, is, is the secondary. So if you just remember that we're good. And some of, some of the times the, there's a reason for it. The secondary shoe will actually do more work in some brake system designs. So if we go a little bit more, here's an, here's a common error. Primary shoes are on one side of the vehicle. So we've got a primary and a primary on the left and on the right, a secondary and a secondary. You could laugh, but it's happened. It's happened more than once. In fact, the car would actually still, you know, function relatively well, but it's still wrong. And it's going to function slightly better if it's correct. And so, uh, and another one that's pretty common, they'll accidentally put the secondary on the front and the primary on the rear. Uh, and, you know, again, if, if the secondary is supposed to do the majority of the work due to the brake design and you put less lining on there, you don't have as much contact. And so um, if, if you saw, you know, that, that video that we made last week about sanding the brake pad flat. So it has a hundred percent contact with the freshly cut rotor. I'm going to show you some evidence right here as to why that's important. If, if all the surface contact wasn't important, there'd be nothing wrong with putting the primary where the secondary goes and the secondary where the primary goes. But see, when the engineers design it, they have a certain amount of square inches of lining material that they expect to be touching. So it's, it's not our role to say it doesn't matter. It's our role to execute 
as designed. So the car comes in with the secondary shoe on the back. We do a brake job. The car leaves with a new secondary shoe on the back. That's going to have the correct amount of contact from the shoe to the drum. Cool. So um, you're allowed to make some mistakes, but but uh, I'm trying to give you some tips and follow TIS. I mean, it's kind of a joke, but the the fact of the matter is that's what you're hired to do. Sometimes, sometimes you might have a little bit of a way of doing something um, that might be slightly different than service information, but, but generally speaking, you want to stick pretty tight to the service manual. As soon as you're deviating from the service manual, you're, you're opening yourself up to problems, to comebacks, to getting in trouble. It's a little extreme, but maybe even to legal issues. So if the service manual specifies do this and you decide you're going to do that and then something goes wrong and they're interrogating you on or about uh, March, whatever the heck date is, 10th, did you knowingly not follow the service manual and do things in contrary to what the service manual called for? Yes, done. You're done. Your case is over. See what I'm saying? Doctors who don't follow protocol, that's malpractice. We just don't have a name for ours. I'm just letting you know. You do have to stick pretty close to service info. All right, continue. Now, how are the linings attached? They could be bonded or they could be riveted, just like shoes, uh, just like uh, brake pads. Um, typically, when they're, when they're riveted, that would be a little bit more for like heavy duty um, like I said, back in the day, they used to drill the rivets out and cut new lining and rivet the new lining on there and then arc them. They're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. We're just, we just unbolt stuff and bolt new stuff. We just have to make sure it's the right stuff. And so there's a couple of difference there. Um, and then, like we said, it could be replaced. Here's a, another really good point. So like Andres, for example, last week had... Uh, done some drums and he got the hardware kit and everything. So if if you're doing drums, you're going to take all these parts off. This one is reusable because look, it's it's a piece of metal. It's not something that's going to fail. But this spring right here, that wears, right? Springs wear out when they're exercised a lot. And they're exercised every time you touch the brakes and release the brakes. So that would be something that would come in the hardware kit to be replaced. So with this spring, this spring, this spring... This horseshoe clip is a one-time use, so it should come with new horseshoe clips. These hold down springs, the pins shouldn't be damaged, but the reason the pin comes in the hardware kit is because a lot of times people try to pull the drum off and there's a lip behind the shoe and they rip the pins out, like I was saying right in the beginning. So if you rip a pin out, you get a hardware kit, the pin will be in the, will be in the hardware kit, 99%. Um, but we, it doesn't come with this, uh, adjuster mechanism and it doesn't come with this adjuster mechanism. Those, we have to take those apart and clean them and properly grease them and put them back together. Some kits come with the cable. Most kits don't. If it doesn't, you may actually have to get the cable separate. If it has a cable, they don't all have a cable, but this is for the parking brake, uh, specifically Roberto, go ahead. Uh, now you're talking about cleaning. Um, I've seen some of the technicians uh our dealer when they're doing drums they mm -hmm. wear a mask uh is that just because of all the brake dust or do you just clean all that before you do the job uh good point it's because of the brake dust the better the better way to do it is using that blue brake parts cleaner and get everything wet right because then then all the particles and the you know because some of it's it's not asbestos but it's still nasty and you're going to blow your nose black stuff's going to come out of there and nasty. So the better thing to do is to use that wet brake parts washer and just wet everything down into the part. You don't have that at the dealer, then your better thing is to do brake clean. Don't go over there with a blow nozzle. That's just ridiculous. And so that's, that's why, or the mask is good. You guys are welcome to use the mask anytime. It's, it's a good idea. Um, and, and this talks about the spring specifically. So all this was like the hardware kit basically. And this is going to vary from one design to the next, but let's just say these are return springs. You can tell because look, this spring is trying to pull towards the center and this spring is trying to pull towards the center. So when you step on the brakes, 
the wheel cylinder pushes outward. And when you release the brakes, the springs pull inward. That's it. It's that simple. And this is actually a mechanism for the auto adjuster, right? But, but that's the type of return spring. Here's the hold down springs. This is normal. There's a special tool for that. You know that you've got, you know you don't have soft hands if you can take these off without the tool, okay? That's the joke, you got soft hands, you know what I'm saying? If, if you could just use your hands only and no tool, then that's how. Now, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying. There, there's quite a few people who could just take these off by hand. There's a tool for it, we're gonna cover the tool later. These are also kind of common. And with these ones, you push them down and then it's hard to spin this whole clip. So a lot of times you push them down, we'll actually just spin the pin. Both of these, part of the magic is going around the backside of the backing plate and actually holding the pin. Um, Cause if you don't, you're pushing the pin in and then it's hard to really get the tension off of it. So hold the pin. Then this I haven't seen in many, many years, but this is another type. They're all hold down springs. They hold the shoe down, but they allow a little bit of movement. Uh, and then there's other specialty springs. So sometimes to um, return links and levers uh, or the self adjuster, they can be all sorts of shapes and sizes. They can push, they can pull, you know, it all varies. But kind of the important thing is a spring, it's made of spring steel, which is made to basically hold its shape and you can deform it and it should come back. You can only do that so many times before the spring becomes fatigued and it's kind of like uh, springs on an old car. If a car's been carrying a lot of weight for a lot of years, you notice it starts to sit lower and lower and lower. The spring steel is wearing. So general rule of thumb um, is best practices would be to do a hardware kit. It, the brake shoes typically will last you know, close to 100,000 miles, which may be somewhere between five and 10 years. By the time you're doing brake shoes, it's probably a good idea to do the springs, especially when the hardware kit could be about $20. I just don't see it making a lot of sense to not replace them. Now, that's not to say that you have to, like you always have to replace the springs. Kind of like last week, you know, the best practice is to resurface the rotors. It's not to say you couldn't just put pads on. Your results are going to probably vary. The better practice would be to put the springs on. Now, if you're in a jam and you need to reuse the springs, you know, then you then you reuse the springs. If you're in a jam and you didn't get to cut the drum or or the rotor, yeah, you, you can probably get away with it. But if it comes back, just know I mean, it's kind of because you didn't follow the best practice procedure. Make sense? It's not impossible for one of those springs to become so fatigued that the spring breaks. And if the spring breaks, now all of a sudden you have a spring bouncing around inside that spinning drum and that it gets wedged in a place. It causes huge gouges in the rotor or in the drum. It gouges out the shoes. So yes, I've absolutely, to answer the chat, I've absolutely seen on numerous occasions hardware fail and snap and pop apart and totally shred all that stuff in there. Part of the reason I'd recommend it as well. Alrighty. And then uh, as the brake shoe wears, this is something that's different on, on uh, drums. As the brake shoe wears, the shoes are expanding. There's like on a disc, on a, on a caliper, there's constant adjustment on the piston sliding outward. The piston comes further and further outward. On drums, not so much. The, the, as the shoes wear, it starts to become further and further reach for the wheel cylinder. So the wheel cylinder has to reach further and further. As the wheel cylinder reaches further and further, the brake pedal gets lower and lower. So if your drums are starting to be out of adjustment, you'll get a brake pedal that's kind of low. You'll go back there if you get the if you get the shoes adjusted nice and tight to the drum, but not too tight, your pedal will be will be higher. So let's say a car comes in, and I've had this many times um, that you know typically it's the front brakes that need to be done because they do seventy to eighty percent of the stopping. So if it comes in with worn pads, and let's say you know I replace the brake pads and I 
resurface or replace the rotors depending on the on the mechanism um, or, or depending on the condition then a lot of times it'll do like let's say it's got 70,000 miles I would probably take a quick peek at the drum at the shoes and if the shoes you know look like they're good they're they're still usable I'd actually sell a clean lube and adjust as well and I'll pull the drum off I'll wash everything down I'll clean everything up I will uh, lubricate any of the points that I can access. It's not that I'll take it all the way apart and access those uh, backing plate support pads, which on the shoe side is the nib. But, you know, basically at least the star adjuster, you know, I'll get that freed up, get it all nice and clean, and then I'll do a fine tune adjustment. And I've had several occasions where people actually come back and they say, wow, I've had brakes replaced so many times, but my brakes have never felt as good as when you did it, you know? And then people want to think, is it because I'm like really talented with the lathe? I'm like, no, it wasn't that at all. It's just your typical flat rate line tech is going to, you know, slam out the front brakes and ignore the drums. And I would take a little more care and I would sell, a, you know, a half an hour or an hour to clean lube and adjust the rear the rear shoes to the drum and it would stop so nice because the pedal was higher and the customers can perceive that they've hit that brake pedal 30 times a day for seven years since they bought the car they know how the brake pedal feels and if i can improve it by that adjustment they will come back actually pretty happy so the drum brake adjustment has a lot to do with uh, brake pedal feel now the question is why is it not self-adjusting? And, you know, because we're looking at it, right? It's a self-adjuster. So here's the mechanism. Basically, this little star wheel should spin, but there's going to be something depending on the design that should make it spin. But whatever the something is, because there's, there's 20 different designs, they never really make a whole lot of force. Like pretty much if you get any small amount of dirt brake dust, you know, there's a lot of brake dust inside the brake drum. You get any bunch of junk in here, all of a sudden it no longer generates enough force to actually turn it. Now, when we're adjusting our brakes and you're hearing the click, 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 that's what the system should do on its own. But sometimes it does it in reverse. Other times it does it when you apply the parking brake, but either way, it's very common that they don't work correctly. It's very common. After I'm done with my clean lube and adjust to get everything all freed up, I do the adjustment manually. They're very happy. Now, theoretically, it may continue to self-adjust because remember, I got the star wheel all freed up. It's moving nice. The problem is it's seven years old. It's got brake dust all over it and it wasn't working when I got to it. So I'm not sure how long it'll work after I'm there because nobody's in there really cleaning it up, right? So they just don't they just don't uh, self-adjust really well. So like, let's look at this one, for example. This is the, the, the mechanism for, as an example, duo servo style brakes. Um, so let's say that we are, the link is moved up and down by action of the brakes while the vehicle's backing up. So in forward, it doesn't adjust. When you put it in reverse, the drum, the, uh, drum is gonna be spinning in the clockwise direction. If you look, this shoe is going to kind of push to the right, right kind of becomes down. As it's doing that, it's going to actually tug on the cable. And the cable is going to basically uh, try to click the next uh, tooth on the star wheel, right? So we're going to move it one way and then we're going to move it the other way. So basically, if you if you picture that arm, if we pull the cable up and then we let the cable go down. We pull the cable up and we let the cable go down. It's constantly trying to click the next tooth on the star wheel, but not if it's got a bunch of brake dust and stuff. So they will vary. This is the duo servo with the cable type. That cable is basically pulling up on this little plate. They call it the self-adjuster arm. Pulls up, drops down. Pulls up, drops down. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Will it work? I don't know. Depends, right? And then there's there's even other types. There's all sorts of different designs. They have little levers and rods and linkages and the way that this thing tilts up and down. They've devised quite a quite a number of different uh, self-adjusting mechanisms. Like even this one, for example, got 
got a parking brake link and it's got these tiny serration teeth. So when this thing flexes down and this one flexes up, they come back together and it tries to grab the next tooth, but only if the brake shoes have worn. So it can't grab the next tooth, can't grab it, can't grab it. And as the brake shoes wear, it says, oh, I can grab it. And so it's supposed to automatically adjust itself up, but you know, cars are also not supposed to break, are they? Sam. Um, and so overall, um, it's a good system, but there's some little, they need a little bit of love sometimes. So drum brakes uh, are basically um, what we control with the pedal. So the, the brake pedal applies the fluid, which applies the shoes. If it's a parking brake within drum brakes, we're applying the same shoes to the same drums, but we're not using the brake pedal. We're using a parking brake pedal or a parking brake handle, like an, like an e-brake handle. That's pulling a cable, which is pulling an arm, which is applying the shoes. It's the same shoes and the same drums, but a different way to apply them. See, so that's kind of where it's different. There's a little bit of a, of a pro tip there. If it's got drum rear brakes and you think that the drums are out of round on your road test, you hit the brakes and you feel, you know, lumpy bumpy in the seat and pedal pedal pulsation like this, that could very well be rear drums out of round, which is kind of like a pulsation. But if you slowly apply the parking brake, you should also be able to feel the pulsation because it's the same shoes and the same drums. And if the same drums are at a round, it should be initiated by both the brake pedal or the parking brake. Now here's how that could look like. So here's your parking brake handle. You pull this up, that pulls a cable to the left. The cable runs all the way to the back of the car, goes through the backing plate. And this is the cable right here. This cable is pulling on this parking brake lever. That's usually like a shiny piece of, uh, metal. So when you tug on the cable, this shiny piece of metal gets pulled to the left. That doesn't do anything except for push on this parking brake push rod to the left. Now that parking brake push rod is, is pushing to the left. Can you see how it's going to shove that primary shoe into the drum? Oh yeah. So it's exactly the same type of mechanism. And then, you know, it can get a little bit tricky, but like, for example, this primary shoe is not anchored at the bottom. So when the primary shoe gets shoved over, it kind of tries to rotate upward, which a lot of times will tend to, you know, actuate the brakes as well. Um, and so we continue. Um, and then this is basically just generally how the drum brakes work. Now that you know all the parts, um, you can see, let's say this wheel is turning counterclockwise. When we go ahead and uh, press the brake pedal, the shoes expand against the inside surface of a brake drum. So this pushes left, pushes the shoe into the drum. This pushes right, pushes the shoe into the drum. And that's essentially uh, how we slow it down. Now it's gonna take a few different things. This, for example, is a floating link. So this shoe and this shoe are connected, but this whole bottom can actually pivot. And so we can do some kind of cool stuff with that. Um, but we'll cover that in just the next slide. It's called self-energizing. And, and servo action is slightly different, but they kind of go together. So what self-energizing means, they can increase the force with which they are applied. Hmm. So it's not a brake booster, but by design, we can we can manufacture and design them a certain way where like you apply a hundred pounds, they can actually make more than that because of the way that they're designed. Kind of hard to explain. Um, but basically, picture the brake shoe comes in contact with the moving drum. Friction tends to carry them the same direction, right? So remember, like on this picture, this drum is turning counterclockwise. If we apply the pedal, that's gonna push this shoe into the drum and the, the drum is gonna kind of grab it and try to move it down, right? You can see that because it's spinning that way. 
when the shoe moves this, when the drum tries to pull this shoe down, that down slowly becomes right. So now this left shoe or the front shoe is actually basically kicking the rear shoe harder into the drum than even just the wheel cylinder pushing on it. See, so we'll kind of basically, basically they get wedged really. It's like a simple way to look at it. So the self-energizing means the brake shoes kind of expand and wedge themselves and really lock the brakes pretty hard. Um, and so that's, that's essentially what this is saying. And that's because uh, they're anchored at one end, but not at the other end. So if you look, these shoes are anchored up here, but these shoes are not anchored down here. And I'm going to be honest, engineering is not what I do. And I've been called out multiple times for, hey, you didn't do the right math. I'm not even going to try. It's not that I can't do math, but you know, if I really wanted to explain this, I'd have to sit here and figure all these numbers out. So I'm going to give you the, the overall, how it's relevant to you, the technician, not explained for an engineer at all. I'm just not the right guy. So direction of force is still counterclockwise. We go ahead and we apply the pedal. That's going to be getting the application force of, for example, 100 pounds. That's going to expand the shoe. And as you can see, this shoe is going to push out. It's going to end up wedging this shoe. And so uh, this one actually is not. Okay, I remember. I've looked at this one. Change this from counterclockwise to clockwise. Just trust me. This shoe gets pushed out. It goes to, to uh, wedge down, right? So this will actually start to back some of the pressure off, but it'll wedge this left shoe in a little bit further. And therefore you actually get a force of 120 pounds because it's actually being wedged. Makes sense? So this, one's, this, one, this one still applies with the 100, but about 20 pounds of that is actually transferred into this shoe. So this car would be going to the right. This would be the primary shoe. This would be the secondary shoe. The secondary shoe is getting more of the wedging action. And so that's why the secondary shoe will have the taller brake lining. It'll have more material on the secondary shoe. Kind of makes sense. It's a little bit weird. But that would be uh, servo action. So that's servo action specifically. So when you kind of combine the two, um, self-energizing and servo basically mean you are going to have a certain design that, and no, Roberto, you don't have to remember this in, in, in extreme detail. You'll Overall, you'll have a certain design where the shoes are going to swing and one of the shoes is going to do less braking and its force is going to be sent into the other shoe, which is going to be do, doing more braking. 90% of the time, the primary shoe is the smaller shoe and the secondary shoe is the larger shoe. And the secondary shoe is the one that's actually being wedged harder and doing more of the braking. That's why they're a little bit of a different size, right? And so that's that servo action. And then this is essentially just summing up where the leading shoe and the trailing shoe is. So I call it the primary and secondary, but leading shoe and trailing shoe, it, they're more specific to... Uh, which one's self-energizing or not self-energizing. So it's the broad strokes. Exactly what's happening, ASC is not going to ask. In fact, for the technician, you don't even really need to know exactly how it's self-energizing and why it's self-energizing. You just need to know there's a reason that the secondary shoe is taller. And it's important that the secondary shoe is put in the back because these, because these items. Remember the, the version I gave you? Who stands in the back of a family portrait? The tall people. Let's put the tall shoe in the back. Okay, and then, so that was kind of summary. We got twin leading shoe, we got uh, leading trailing or duo servo, and we're just gonna cover what each one looks like. All right, so twin uh, leading shoe is, basically it's, it's not only the least common, it's, we don't really use that anymore. 
Um, it was popular back in the day on front wheels because it was really good in forward, but not that good in reverse. But we don't put drums on the front of cars anymore, and we haven't since like 1972, I think. It might even been a little before. So this is a little bit irrelevant, but it's still something I'll show you. So if you look, two, two, uh, two wheel cylinders, they're not dual acting wheel cylinders. They're just single piston wheel cylinders. So this is an example of that twin leading shoe. And you're kind of like, what the heck is this? They're, they do tend to be like top to bottom rather than side to side. So you got a wheel cylinder on the left, left and a wheel cylinder on the right. Um, they both have adjusters on both wheel cylinders. And again, they work good in forward. They don't work real well in reverse. And so here's one that's a little bit more common. Leading trailing shoe, that's gonna be very common on the rear wheels of a, fr a front wheel drive. The reason why um, on a front wheel drive, we have the front engine, front transmission, tra technically transaxle. We got a lot of weight on the front. A lot of times we don't need a ton of braking ability on the rear. And so drum brakes in the drum brakes make sense in the rear, but they also have equal braking forces in rear and in uh, forward and reverse. You know, so this is, this is going to be a little bit better. We don't need a ton of braking back there, but it'd be nice to have good brakes in forward and reverse on that type of car. And so it uses a single wheel cylinder that has two pistons. That's the double acting like we were talking about. Um, here's what that looks like. So the leading trailing that does some of that wedging action, depending on which direction it's going. Um, and so it, so the, the leading trailing is actually uh, slightly different than, let's just say, uh, duo servo. And the leading trailing, there's going to be a wedging action here. And there's not going to be a wedging action here. So one of the shoes is self-energizing. One of the quick ways to know that it's a leading trailing, and Toyota uses quite a bit of these, is on the bottom, there's this anchor. So if you ever see this, this like uh, weird shaped anchor on the bottom, so the shoe lands in the anchor on the bottom, and then on the top, it's up into the wheel cylinder. That's a pretty good indication that it's some sort of leading trailing. They may vary a little bit, but... Overall, it's leading trailing. It's not going to do that whole crazy wedging thing because if you look, if this brake pad is shoved into the drum, this drum can't, this shoe can't come back and kick the rear drum and shove the rear drum, right? Because it, there's a wedge right there. It stops that action. So this will have uh, the same shoes typically front and rear. Not going to even really look a whole lot different. Um, if they're not the same, it, it's not the lining. It might be like one hole's different or something, or maybe where the parking brake arm attaches is different, something like that. It'd be pretty similar. So there's your leading trailing. And then here's one more uh, view of it. This one's slightly different, but same type of an idea. So there will still be a self adjuster with a star wheel, still gonna be a parking brake cable going to a parking brake uh, lever or arm, um, but, but basically that's the one version. The way you're gonna go about doing shoes on this is gonna be different than even other leading trailing or duo servo or anything. Every design can really vary. Overall, one similarity will be wheel cylinder on the top and an anchor on the bottom. That's about all you're gonna get that's consistent. Like if you look at these, they look similar but to change the shoes, it's different springs in different spots, different hold downs. They're both leading trailing, but they're, but exactly the details of how to replace them is going to vary. So if you were to ask me, how do you do the drums on a 2014 Tacoma? I really can't, honestly, in my mind, I can't even picture what that looks like. So that's probably where you're going to end up. You might become a little bit more familiar with some more than others, but like there's a lot of different designs of drums out there. A lot. Now here's Duo Servo. Here, they get their name from using the servo action in both forward direction and the reverse direction. So it's Duo. You might even call it Dual, and Toyota does call it Dual, but technically it's Duo. Uh, use a single wheel cylinder with two pistons, kind of the same. It's a little bit like the leading trailing. 
Um, but here you go. You look at this one. It looks kind of like leading trailing, but who can notice a major difference? Take a step back. Uh, they're only connected at one point on the top. There's no big anchor down here. So this is an adjustable floating link, but it floats. It's not, it's not anchored <clears throat> at the bottom. So that's your dual servo. Um, you'll see this on, on, uh, on some Toyotas, but these were really common on the domestics. This is the one I was telling you, if I had uh, one of these and I had the right drum brake tool, you could, it's amazing with the right tool. You can pop these springs on and off so fast. I had that set up on my older Lexus. Yeah. So if you had the right tool, they, you could knock these out, but um, you know, that that's only one way to do it. Here's another way to do it. You got that center link at the top. Uh, this one, you might be able to at least kind of use the tool, but you can see that uh, this one, as it's turning, you know, the left is front, right? So it's turning counterclockwise. The wedging action on the front shoe is going to push down, which is also going to wedge the, the rear shoe upward. And they're both wedged. So it's duo servo. It's They're both wedging. And if you're in reverse, they're both going to wedge. So it's... Um, they're they're pretty good. Like I said, Toyota will call it dual. I don't know if it was a translation issue or what the deal was, but it was um, you know, it's the same, it's the same overall. You'll look, it's a floating link on the bottom, it's not anchored. Okay, and so um, and then here's just another another version of the of a similar system. They can actually put the adjuster at the top and we'll have some sort of a link down at the bottom to loosely connect them. Like in this case, they call this the number two strut. So different design for achieving the same thing. Um, now, when we get into drum brake inspection, um, there's a few things we're worried about. Obviously the drum shoe thickness. So we're just measuring it like this. You remember the gauges we have, green, yellow, red. They don't, you can use them, but the colors don't tell you anything. So if you have four millimeters on a pad, that's like time to replace it. If you have four millimeters on a drum, on a shoe, that's new. So by all means measure them, but uh, generally, you know, one, one millimeter is where you're starting to get to replacement. If it's at two, you might say, yeah, oh, you're at two millimeters, but, but uh, they're gonna be quite a bit thinner because they don't come with all that much material. And additionally, there's a few things we want to do. So this tool is a drum brake micrometer. I can show you how to use a drum brake micrometer. I wouldn't recommend using a drum brake micrometer. To be really, really honest with you, it's it's so rare for me. If I go to use a drum brake micrometer, I have to actually remember how to use it first. And it takes me a little while. And they're kind of hard to set up. There's one really nice thing, though. This is a dial, kind of like a dial indicator. So if you set up the drum brake micrometer and you get a number on the dial, you can spin it and see if the number changes. And that'll tell you if if this direction, let's say uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock is different than this direction, which is 12 and six, that'll tell you your drum is like an oval and so what do you think we call a drum that's got a difference between 12 and 6 and 3 and 9? Oval. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. It's not called ovulated. And it's definitely not called anything to do with ovulation either. That is called out around. So take oval and just forget I even said it. Don't be coming to me and tell me that the drum is ovulated. I don't need to hear anything about, okay? Just add around will do. Just add around is fine. Okay, so there we go. We can measure that pretty easily with the drum bake micrometer. It's not the only way though. If we wanted, we would probably just use a caliper. Now this isn't a caliper, but I'm gonna use that as an example. If this was a digital caliper, that would be pretty easy to measure the diameter too. So this is one tool. And the digital caliper is a different tool, but it's got to be a really big, it's going to be a long one because if the drum brake diameters, let's say it's a nine inch drum, you have to have like a caliper that's bigger than the standard one. So we do have drum brake digital calipers. This, however, 
is not a precision measuring tool. This is the tool to pre-adjust the brakes like we had talked about. So we would actually expand the tool to fit the drum, lock the lock nut, swing it over here and adjust the adjuster. So the brake shoe contacts the tool which was set to the drum. And that's a pretty good, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good tool. It, it does, it's all right. Um, but for some people who tried it, you know, sometimes it's hard to get it exactly fine tuned, you know, so there's other ways to do it. And I got a pretty good video on the way that I would adjust the drum. In fact, I got about three different ways to adjust drums. Um, another thing that we could be concerned about is drum break noises. So drum break noise come from a few things. If we have a lot of dust, they'll make noise. See this groaning noise can be caused by excessive brake dust. Basically what they do is like, the brake dust becomes kind of like graphite. It's almost like a dry lubricant. And then the brake dust kind of gets all in one spot. And now the shoe's up against the metal. And then the shoe's up against the brake dust and the shoe's up against the metal. It'll be sort of like a grip and slip. And they'll make some funky noises. So a lot of times cleaning this out will resolve it. But to me, I'm noticing something. I'm looking at that drum and I'm seeing it's really shiny. We had a noise for shiny drums. It reminds me of a donut. Mm. Those drums are glazed. So those drums probably aren't going to stop that good. And they will tend to make noise when they're glazed as well. This would probably be a pretty good candidate for potentially maybe a resurface. Um, but we wouldn't just do that out of nowhere. You know, it'd be one of those things where you know, if they have a noise, we might get into it and probably have to do something like that. Or if the brake shoes wear out, by the time those brake shoes wear out, that drum is going to more than likely have some defects. So at best, we're probably going to do a resurface and new shoes, especially because they end up with a lip right there. And at a worst, you know, we're going to do probably shoes and replace the drums. It's not something that's done really that often. You know, they, we may not be doing this this service until 100,000 miles or more. So even if they, they need new drums, it's, it's not the end of the world. But if we can measure them and get them uh, within the maximum diameter, then, then we should do that. We'll be cutting drums tomorrow. So we'll set up a couple layers to do drums and at least one uh, or maybe two to do disc still to do rotors. So grinding noise typically would be the friction lining wears to metal. Now you're metal to metal. Metal to metal ruins the drum. So that's guaranteed to add cost. Um, and then a clicking could be either A, brake shoes have some sort of weird wear and grooves, or the drum could be cut too rough. And, and I would even add to that, I've seen in numerous occasions where something broke inside, like some hardware, some spring or something, and it's actually hitting. I've seen quite a, quite a bit of that. Um, so it, it's mostly going to be a take it apart and inspect right now. Um, I actually cut that off my fault. When we go to do this brake adjuster, it's calling for a high temperature um, grease application point. So like I was saying, technically, you don't have to use brake caliper grease. You could use a high temperature grease here, 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 and right here in here on the threads and on the other end. So you've seen it in the service manual, it's calling for, for uh, lubrication in those points. And then some precautions. So like one thing that uh, I think Roberto was saying about cleaning it up, use something like this, a dispersing brake dust into the solvent is gonna be better than into the air. Brake dust is, it's, it's hazardous either way, but probably not quite as much as like asbestos. So don't use the, the blow gun. Brake fluid on skin is pretty nasty. It can, it can cause like some, almost looks like a crazy weird pimple um, where it gets like infected or at least irritated. Uh, but in your eyes, it's a really big deal. So just be ready for this. This is kind of, you know, summary. And then we, we're going to cover some resurfacing as more part of the lab lesson, but when, when we do the resurface, the actual way to clean the rotor off is soap, hot, warm soapy water or hot soapy water, but uh, brake clean works pretty well as well. So, um, and the part, brake parts washer is really good. And then uh, 
This is Bao in 30 years. There you go, Bao. How you doing? Okay. <clears throat> Am I right, though? All right. Parking brake. Very good. Very good. So here is uh, a little bit about the parking brake. It's the secondary brake. So really, it's it's both a parking brake and emergency brake, but it's really a parking brake. It's designed to be a parking brake, a parking brake being a holding brake, a holding brake being something that should only be applied when it's stopped. And if it's only applied when it's stopped, there should be no wear, right? They shouldn't be wearing each other out. So everything we're about to say on parking brakes, consider technically a standalone parking brake system really shouldn't need to be replaced. Like the linings shouldn't be worn, but they probably will be. Um, and then also in the case of emergency, hydraulic failure, whatever, by all means, use the parking brake as an emergency brake, but that's its secondary design. It's not really made for that. Okay, and then there's lots of different types, top hat style, drum mounted, electric over hydraulic, driveline brakes or electric brakes. So that was one of the things in the, in the comment, in the chat I saw. Yes, we're gonna talk about electronic parking brake, trust me. So again, it's by, by um, government mandate, it has to be separately activated from the service brakes. And the driver must be able to lock it applied. Makes sense. Now, now that can be a push button, by the way, or it can be a lever or some sort of handle or whatever. It can be foot or hand operated. Those are fine. And uh, because disc brakes require higher ap applied forces to operate, it's a little tougher to make a disc parking brake. So we used to really like drums in the rear because it was very easy to make a drum a parking brake because it had everything already there. And we were just adding a cable and a handle. But with discs, we have to do a little bit of modification. So here's some examples. This is the most rare. Um, you'll see this on old Toyotas. It's actually like a T handle. You grab it on the dash and you, you know, pull it back. And then if you were done, you actually grab it, twist it and push it back in. So that was the stick type. I don't, I don't really see those anymore, but they were fun while, while they, while they were around more common, the center lever, or really just called like the parking brake, the e-brake handle. It's probably more what I would call it. And then we've got uh, the pedal that is like, you push the pedal down and then to release it, you push it down again, or we've got the pedal that you push down and then to release it, you have to pull a little handle, a parking brake release, all different types. Um, here, for example, the rear parking brakes are applied using a cable and ratcheting lever. Boom. So right there, pull up on the handle. That'll pull the cable. The cable will pull on that little parking brake lever, push on the strut, and you're done. Because it's drum brakes, it was very simple. Um, but if it has disc brakes, it's going to be either an integrated parking brake caliper which means the parking brake is going to squeeze the same pads as the regular brakes. That's possible. Or it's going to be a top hat style. So a top hat is like, it's like literally a top hat. You would have a mini drum inside of a standard looking rotor. So the brake pads would squeeze the rotor. And then the mini drum, that would just have parking brake shoes and a parking brake cable that would apply just the, the mini drum. So they, either one can be fine. There's positives and negatives to each, but we'll cover both. And then an electric parking brake is used on some vehicles. So some is becoming more and more and more and more and more. Um, there's quite a few benefits to an electric parking brake. The primary benefit being a computer can control it. So if you want my read on it, I'll tell you what I see. In most things in automotive, we're noticing less and less requirement from the driver. So if the driver is supposed to remember to, let's say, turn off the turn signal, but we know they won't, we'll make a turn signal that automatically turns off. If we know that the customer is supposed to be going a certain speed, when they try to downshift into reverse and they're automatic using the sequential or the sport mode, we've taken that away from them too. 
you try to downshift into first at 80, the computer says, no, absolutely not. So you'll see the trend is, let me, let me make it simple for you. More and more dummy proof cars. It's, you know, some people will say, oh, the new cars are so complicated, but like, how? you because you have to push the button to start it rather than turn the key i mean you really don't have to know hardly anything and the parking brake's no exception if you have a modern car with electronic parking brake you put the car in park as soon as you open the door you hear the parking brake apply so if we can make something controlled by a computer that allows the customer the customer to be a little dumber we we pretty much will do that We'll absolutely go for that. That's a great idea. We'll have the car stop itself, steer itself, definitely apply its own parking brake. Generally, we're not going to have the parking brake, brake apply unless we're stopped, though. So, you know, there's that. But um, they can do a number of different things. Typically, electronic parking brake is going to apply the regular brake pads. So it's more like an integrated caliper, more so than the top hat design. Um, but it's electronically controlled. So that means typically some sort of a control module is going to control it. It may be the ABS computer or it may be a parking brake computer that's standalone or et cetera. So we'll actually talk about a little bit more diagnosis on those two. Here's an example of the parking brake drum brake components. So this is all drum brake stuff, right? Now you see why we're covering parking brakes as well. This is your parking brake cable pull it to the left, that pulls this parking brake lever to the left, remember? And then that shoves the, in this case, it's the actual adjuster, the star wheel adjuster, shoves that to the left that pushes this left shoe into the uh, drum. And there's your parking brake, done, simple. Um, and then there's quite a few different types, but overall, they're gonna use some sort of lever mechanism, a cable, a strut, and you know, they, they can vary. Um, and then this is just really talking about um, how we use drums to also be parking brakes. But here's an interesting thing. If there's a problem with a parking brake, start with the basics of the system. So like if you have a parking brake problem, probably the first thing you're going to do is do a visual inspection of the regular brakes together. So if you have a problem with the brake shoes, that's going to not only affect your regular brakes, your service brakes, it's also going to affect your parking brake as well. So making sure stuff is moving, making sure things look correct. You're also going to look at condition of springs, the, the parking brake strut. It's not uncommon. Well, it's probably uncommon. It's not impossible that someone did the drum brakes, didn't know what that parking brake strut was, struggled to get it in and just said, forget it and threw it out. So if your parking brake doesn't work, you may have to pull a drum apart and look to see, is that part in there? Are the, par are the drum brakes missing any components? Because that component may be for the parking brake itself. Like, so for example, that parking brake strut, the parking brake lever, also is the screw adjustment way out, or is the drum so worn and the shoe so loose, right? If you push the pedal down, your regular brake pedal's got a lot of movement, but if, if you have a smaller parking brake uh, lever in your, in your shoes are way out of adjustment, you actually may not get enough force on those shoes against the drum to even stop it. It may be a, just a regular brake adjustment. So if you have a parking brake adjustment type of concern, the first thing you do is not go for the parking brake cable adjustment, not, no. Your first step is to go with the base brake adjustment. Adjust, adjust the drums, shoes first, get all that stuff dialed in, then recheck the parking brake. If, you're, if your regular brake, base brakes are adjusted correctly and your parking brake is still, let's say coming up, you know, we, we wanna shoot for seven clicks and you're still coming up 18 clicks and it's like way up here. Yeah, maybe it does have a stretched cable, but it's 10 times more common for the brake shoes to be out of adjustment than it is to have a stretched cable. So you always start with adjusting the drum brakes. Understood? Let me on a test question. <laughs> okay, so there, for example, we're showing the mechanism. We're also showing this is the self-adjusting mechanism. 
And so part of the reason this is here is because in this design, every time you apply the parking brake lever, it's going to actually swing this lever upward. And then when you release the parking brake lever, it's going to swing it downward. So now look at these teeth very carefully. You swing it upward. It's on the, it's on like the back side of the teeth, the rounded side. It just kind of pops over them. But when it comes downward, it tries to grab a tooth and pull it down. So that's the self adjuster. The parking brake actuates the self adjuster. So that's, one reason to tell the customer, you know, hey, it's not a bad idea to use your parking brake, at least periodically. Now, the self-adjuster is probably in bad condition. It's not going to work. But go ahead, tell me. Let me know. Um, and then integrated mechanical parking brake calipers. So this is where we get away from drums with parking brake. We're on disc with parking brake. So this, this is a caliper, but you notice it's bigger and chunkier on the back. It's got a brake line going to it, but it's also got a brake cable, like a metal cable going to it. And that's because that metal cable is going to pull on this lever, rotate it. And you notice this is a, this is a threaded screw. That's actually going to twist and push the piston out and squeeze the piston, squeeze the pads against the rotor. So as soon as you pull a caliper off a rear of a vehicle and you see it's the type you can't just compress the piston, you actually have to like turn it. You're turning it with the, with the cube or with the um, retractor tool that spins. That's an integrated caliper. You instantly know that's a parking brake that's integrated with the regular disc brakes. Cool, makes sense. That's a dead giveaway. It can look several different ways. Like for example, this is the this is the threaded rod, uh, and this is actually using a couple of check balls, and and sometimes it's called like a ball and ramp, or uh, they have they have some different designs, you know, but they they'll all kind of work similar. There'll be some sort of a lever, and the lever is going to convert the the rotating motion, and it's somehow going to make the pad apply. It may be that ball and ramp, it may be that threaded rod. It it's going to be there's a number of different ways. But additionally, the shaft has a seal. The seal is going to prevent fluid leakage. So if this, if you have a parking brake caliper that's leaking brake fluid, it needs a new caliper. To rebuild those is even more difficult than a regular caliper, which is actually kind of easy. So I should say it's difficult. Um, but these are complicated. A lot of times they need special service tools. So if you do see a caliper leaking, and it's a parking brake type caliper, just know that that's definitely going to need to be replaced. They used to go bad a lot. They've been, I think they improved some of the designs. They've been quite a bit more reliable. Okay. And then um, it's, it's a good way to do it so we can keep our disc brakes, right? And then uh, they still have the same issues that drum brakes have, uh, that drum brake uh, based parking brakes have. The cable rusts, the parts wear out, et cetera. The only improvement is these are generally self-adjusting, so we don't need to worry about doing adjustments. That's one positive. Not to say the cable can't stretch, but if the brake pads wear, it doesn't make our parking brake out of adjustment. And so here's even some more uh, details. So as you, um, let's say we're gonna, uh, we're gonna be, operating it over time, as the brake pads wear, the piston is gonna come out a little bit further. And as the piston comes out further, it's generally gonna automatically rotate this adjuster screw, which is more like a push rod in this case. So it just maintains automatic adjustment all the time. It's pretty nice. Now, if you need to push those back in, um, this is the Toyota SST. You could use the cube. I like the cube personally, but this is the Toyota SST. You just have to remember it calls for these little cutouts need to be at uh, 12 and six because that's going to require engaging this locking pin, this locking or locating pin. So if that's not in the right spot, it's going to, the, the, the uh, pad is going to sit crooked on the piston and you're gonna have all sorts of crazy bad brake pad wear. So make sure it's set right. Additionally, the brake pad needs to sort of hold the piston so that the screw adjuster 
pushes it out. It doesn't just spin and never move. So got to have it in the right spot. But you can do this. Now, here's the top hat. The top hat, as you can see, this is where the pads would be with the caliper. And then within there, there's a mini drum, what I would call it. But there's no wheel cylinder on this. It's just a cable basically operating a lever that expands these shoes. And these shoes are much smaller, much weaker. They're not going to make anywhere near the force as a, as a bigger drum, drum setup. But remember, it's just, a, it's just a holding brake. So that's more than fine. Um, and so, um, again, it's both of them combined. If you take a look at it uh, from here, you can understand the drum is inside of the top hat part. Right. So it's fairly protected, but like it's saying here, it can still get beat up over time. A lot of times they're trapping the rust. <clears throat> a lot of times the cables get rusty. The shoes can tend to disintegrate. Right in the middle right here is where we'd have an axle. So like in your fall semester, we talk a lot about the axle. If the axle's leaking, uh, gear oil, or you know they'll call it gear lubricant or um, similar, it's, it's gear oil. That would be getting all over these shoes. That would ruin them. They probably, you'd hit, you'd apply the parking brake and you probably wouldn't get a whole lot of stopping if they're covered in oil. That happens in drums as well, by the way. So if you open up a drum brake setup and it smells like gear oil and it's like differential fluid, that's 99% going to be the axle seal. If not a defect with that axle bearing and or the axle shaft itself, but something along the lines of an axle seal we'd need a little more diagnosis, but, but basically you can see the, the top hat design is in here and um, there is an adjuster just like with drum brakes, but we shouldn't need to adjust it because remember they're just holding. Now, unfortunately customers forget and they apply the parking brake and they don't realize it's on and they drive it and the little red brake light, they don't care about that. They just put some tape over it. They, crank the tunes up, put up the music, you know what I'm saying? And next thing you know, the parking brake's worn out. The parking brake, the brake shoes, you know, all these things have happened on more than one occasion. So you may actually have to work on with these at some point. And that's kind of why this is going to be the future, right? If it's a parking brake that's electronic, as soon as you put it in drive, it can actually disable the parking brake for you using the computer, right? So it's, it's like I said, it's dummy proof. And it's actually even a little bit safer. So like a lot of cars, if you put it in drive and you open the door, it'll actually put the parking brake on right then and there. Boom, it'll stop you. So you can't run yourself over. So there's some, you know, there's definitely some benefits of an electronic parking brake, right? So electronic parking brake typically is like that integrated parking brake in the disc brake caliper, except rather than turning a lever like we used to, we'll just put a motor on it and this motor will actually, it'll turn and that'll either A, run the wedge in and if it runs the wedge in, it'll push the piston applied or there's other types that have the, th the threaded screw and the motor's actually gonna turn that screw. There's a bunch of different designs. But essentially, uh, the motor is going to actuate the piston, which is going to squeeze the pads against the rotor. Cool. So we don't we don't have to actually do any physical labor. We touch a button, or we just let the computer do it. You know, like on a Prius, if you put the car in park, the parking brake applies. It's done. Right. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and then a good point here is can also be integrated with the controller area network, which is the CAN bus, right? So if we put it on the network, now we can have many different computers request to apply the parking brake. So if you had a car that's rolling away, it can apply the parking brake. If you forgot to park, put it in park, you can apply the parking brake. If you open the door, the body control module can request to apply the parking brake. If, you know, you name it, a lot of things. And that's good and bad. It's good for the driver. Generally, it's, I wouldn't, I guess bad is not a good word, but well, it kind of is for the, for the shade tree mechanic, that's bad because now the shade tree mechanic wants to jump in and compress those rear calipers 
but they don't even know that if they forget the wheel lock or something, next thing you know, you open the driver's door and it applies the, the parking brake and blows the caliper clean out because they already got the caliper off the rotor. Makes sense. So for someone who doesn't know, the electronic parking brake has been a kind of a nightmare. And I've put a few videos on how to retract the piston and other people have come back and, you know, said that there's other ways to do it. So this would be a Daniel statement here, follow TIS. So follow the service manual on how to do this because I've done a whole bunch of them and they do tend to vary. Some of the nicer ones to me, you can actually put it in uh, service mode and it'll retract the parking brakes. You know, basically the tech stream or the scan tool goes on the CAN bus and, and puts out a message on the CAN high and low saying, um, excuse me, can you retract your caliper pistons? And then the parking brake control module says, oh yeah, I got you fam. And he goes, Meow. and then you're ready to go. You don't even have to get the tool out. You don't have to do the cube. You don't have to do pliers. You don't have to do the SST, none of that. Done, ready to go. I like those. The common person who doesn't have access to information and or tools and equipment, they don't like those. What they're going to try to do is unbolt stuff and turn things. And sometimes they're taking stuff apart in a way that wasn't supposed to be done. And it might actually be really smart. It might be like, oh, that was really good. You found a workaround. But for me, you know, I'm more in my comfort zone with you guys and you have access to what you need to do the job the right way. So we're going to mostly focus on the right way. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. If, if you follow the precautions and it says, you know, so you know, if you open up the door, you're going to blow the caliper piston out. You're at least going to know not to open up the door or, or you know, put it, in, put it in some sort of service mode. Okay, so for all the positives and the negatives. And sometimes they might even work at the proximity sensor. A lot of times we're not stopping the cars that way anymore. But right here, we start to get into the ADAS area and we are going to do that um, that's going to be like, basically as part of our summary, ADAS being advanced driver assist systems, we'll get into alignments, uh, camera alignments and calibrations and et cetera. So pretty good. And now here's one you may not likely ever see, but they're common on big vehicles. This is a driveline parking brake. It's basically a drum with shoes and it's right at the back of a transmission. And this is where the drive shaft would go. So we'd actually break the drive shaft, not snap the drive shaft, but we'd, uh, we would stop. We would lock the drive shaft stopped, breaking the drive shaft. And that was actually good. It has a little bit, uh, a little bit of an advantage because we have the differential. And so it, it makes it easier to actually stop it here. And additionally, it's better on heavy vehicles because when you put a car in park, there's a little parking pole, which is a little, a little metal lever that comes over and grabs a drum on the transmission and it locks it. That's why a car won't move in park. Well, if it's a, if it's a 22,000 pound truck, it's a lot of weight to be on that little parking pole. So it's going to relieve the stress of the parking pole. It'd be better to do a driveline brake on a heavy vehicle. Cool. And then here's electrical over hydraulic. And in, in this picture, um, this is right from the text. Um, it's a good book, but that's, that one's pretty rough. That one looks like there's something wrong with it. Like it was battery acid on or something, but, but basically that's your ABS unit. Your ABS unit has the ability to apply its own brakes. So for those of you guys who did the, well, you've all done the electronic ones. Remember it has a motor. And so if we run the motor and open the valves, we can apply the brakes anyway. So the parking brake, because it would be applied through electronic, that's a different application than the, the regular brake. And because we can apply it electronically and then shut a valve, which will maintain the pressure, that meets the requirement for locking it applied. Actually, we can just literally use software if we wanted to be our parking brake. We already have all, all the, the hard parts are in play. We have the pump, we have the motor, we have the lines, we have the valves, all part of ABS. All right, cool. That's more like what the ADAS is going to use. The ADAS is just going to go right to this module and say, hey, there's a person behind us, hit the brakes. And this will be like, yep, 
Accumulators already got pressure stored. It probably doesn't even need to run the pump and motor. Open the valve, boom, the brakes are on, done. Did not run over the person walking behind the car. That was picked up by the rear camera or the sonar sensor or whatever. Cool. And then aero hydraulic again is, is like it says, integrated inside the electro hydraulic unit of ABS, like I told you. Um, and then when we get into diagnosing and uh, servicing the parking brake, a lot of this is basic. Looking at the cables, this cable has a little spot that's rubbed through the rubber casing. The rubber is serves two purposes. It keeps the, the, the moisture and the rust causing stuff right? Salt in some areas, would you say? Huh? Not here, but somewhere. Salt and road debris and moisture get up in there and they corrode the cable and now the cable won't move. It's seized. So this, if this vehicle has a concern of the parking brake won't release, it's stuck on, that's the problem right there. If this vehicle has a concern of the parking brake pedal goes all the way to the floor before it applies, well, this might actually be the problem too. The rust may have got in there, started to seize the cable, and now the cable's stretching and starting to snap the little cables that make up the bigger cable, right? That could all be related. You may be able to actually provide some lube on these cables, but not much because it's long and it's all in that rubber sleeve. They're very difficult to lubricate. I actually have a special tool for motorcycle cable lubrication, but even that one can be a little tough to use. Um, and then looking for obvious signs, like what we just saw, right? It, basically, um, cables, corrosion, et cetera. Stretching can be a little tricky to diagnose. Driveline parking brakes actually that have a problem can cause uh, failure to the driveline itself. And then let's say we're looking at the cable here. We're looking at this linkage. We're looking at this adjuster. We're looking at the equalizer, which makes both apply at the same time. If the cable's stuck in the equalizer, it may apply one and not the other. There's also an adjustment right there, right? These are all things we're gonna look at, but if it's an electronic parking brake, probably one of the first things we need to do is actually just go ahead and check for codes, uh, check to see if there's any faults. Um, we could actually go on and do some tests. We can apply it, we can release it. If it's an electronic, our, our main workhorse is going to be here. If it's a if it's a mechanical, our main workhorse is going to be visual inspection. Parking brake is is different than hydraulics. Hydraulics, you may have to measure pressure and you know get a little more technical. Parking brake, this was all look and and now this is going to be more a little more complex, but should be right up your alley. Um, a little more electronic type diagnosis, um, and then of course. Lack of use is a common issue. So if the customers aren't using it, they don't have to, but you either want to use it or not use it. If you ever want to use it ever, you should probably use it periodically because like so many things, if you don't use it, you lose it. You know the term, right? So if you don't use it, it's seizing up. It's, it's getting stuck. It's kind of like, you know, it's been abandoned and the cobwebs are starting to grow and the rust is growing on there. And then you go to use it one time and now it's seized up. So the, the rule of thumb where I grew up in the rust belt was don't touch the parking brake. And we get somebody who'd be brand new and they, they on their car, they use the parking brake. So they jump in the customer car and they mash the parking brake and then it doesn't release. And then we're there trying to free it up because the customer says, well, I don't use my parking brake. I don't want to fix it, but the car won't move. So we have to fix it just to get it to move. And then we tell everybody, hey, stop, don't use the parking brake. You know, so that was pretty standard where I'm at. Here, I don't know if you guys are using the parking brakes, cool. Um, hopefully they're not rusty. If you ever get one that's from the beach and they don't use it and you use it, you might be having to fix, you know, the seas right there because now it won't move. It's very possible. And then, you know, because we're doing ECMs in the, in the parking brake system, we may have to get more into, uh, you know, using live data, using active testing. Um, there, there may even be some, like, they might even come out with a programming update we may have to do. So everything that goes with the scan tool. And you may also find some TSBs on the subject, right? And then 
just generally a lot of it's going to be visual broken pieces damaged pieces uh, and even maintaining it so it'd be it'd be great to use it periodically is going to help a lot and you might possibly be able to do some lubrication although some of the challenges is where the parking brakes exposed let's say it's uh, right there near the drum or the or the rotor we don't really want oil in that area so they're also especially difficult to use lubrication and you guys made it so if you've got questions now would probably be a good time anybody got questions no question it's not that complicated um for ASC it's going to be fairly generic there's never going to be math there's never going to be any oh is it duo servo or leading trailing or they're gonna, they're not going to ask stuff like that um they may ask things like I saw in the chat they may ask something kind of simple about uh rebuilding a wheel cylinder they may ask something about adjusting a parking brake or diagnosing an electronic parking brake or something. But if you look at drums, there's only five questions and parking brake is rolled into uh, part A. So there probably won't be a ton of uh, questions on that, but should be getting fairly close. So come on, you got nothing for me? Feeling pretty good? I gotta find, I gotta actually send out two cahoots today, so. You get to do double. Oh, I gotta remember what the heck chapters they were. Madi, go ahead. I see your hand. Professor Kelly, I just want to ask for tomorrow if you want to practice on the drum brakes, we can use the Tacomas in the lab and take the drum brake out and put it back. And yeah. Yeah, we've been, yep, yeah, Tacomas. We got some on the Corollas, but yeah, we could definitely do that. That yeah, would be good. I wanted to take the Sienna, but I couldn't take it this week. My brother-in-law needed, so it's bad for me. Yeah. Maybe next week you might still get to do it. We'll see. Okay. So you guys need chapters five and seven. Very good. Very good. Um, Daniel, I'm gonna answer you because you uh. You sent it to me, but this is a good question for everybody. Is anybody having trouble with the book codes? Because the book codes that I got should be good to go. But if there's problems, I need to know about it. The book, the course codes, I get those. If it's your book code from the scholarship, I don't know anything about that. So Daniel, give me, tell me more what you're talking about. Hello. I hear you. How you doing? All right. Okay. Um. Let's see. Let me just. That should be better. Um. Yeah. No. Uh. The uh. The the codes provided for um through Canvas. Uh. Were not working. And um, I just wanted to know if we could check that out, um, because I could I could share my screen and all that, and you could see how I'm, what I'm seeing, I guess. Who who's using the book? Who's got the book codes working? Because because I'm happy to help. It's my thing, but um, some of you guys who are using it might be able to help a little bit quicker. Yeah. Shoot it! I think I can give you a screen share. The video will be, it'll probably be a day. It usually takes a while for this one to process. So let me see. Daniel, will let you screen share right now? I don't know if that's allowed. I don't even know if I have the book link. Um... Okay, somebody put in the chat, they're working, you have to click the course ID or Section A5. Yeah, Daniel, if you can do screen share, we could definitely get you rolling. Let me see. I'm going to do a full stop recording.